really a lot of what people have said uh, anticipates what uh, the, the um, Pope goes on to say in this. But uh, he, he turns to the figure of Christ and the, the text he uses there very much. There's uh, written out some of the... This Colossians 1.24, you remember that's very important. That's about the <coughs> completing what is lacking in the suffering of Christ. The book of Job. Uh, and then here, John 3.16, which is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that man may not perish but might have eternal life. And he begins his meditation on Christ from that verse, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so this introduces us, you remember the Pope said many of, uh, much of the thinking of our natural human thinking and the thinking that you find in the Old Testament is based around the idea of justice, which is, which is all true up to a point which is true up to a point, but not the ultimate meaning of existence. And when it says God so loved the world, therefore underlying the work of salvation is divine love. And he gave his only begotten son, he gave him. And that already points to the cross where Christ gave himself in obedience to the Father, so that salvation will be brought about by the suffering of the Son. And the salvation is that Christ brings is a total liberation from evil. But we are in a new dimension here, the Pope says, which goes beyond the perspective of justice. We enter the dimension of redemption and redemptive love. And that's really, again, as I say, this is a journey. This is what he wants to, to, to get us to, to be aware of this whole world that Christ has opened up for us of redemptive love. Suffering is not only something that happens to us in time. There is also the possibility of a definitive evil, definitive suffering, the loss of eternal life, being rejected by God, damnation. In a way, Christ, it's one, one rather terrifying side of the New Testament that, uh, uh, that because God's come so close, the consequences of rejecting God have become far more serious than we had dreamed before. Uh, there wasn't in the Old Testament the concept of hell in our sense of eternal damnation. Um, that, that comes, paradoxically, with the New Testament, but at the same time, the deliverance from it. And this is uh, a, a sort of language he uses a lot. Christ comes to strike evil right at its roots. He wants to attack the very root of evil, pull this horrible evil which has entered human history, entered our hearts, entered our lives, to pull it up by the very roots. And the roots of evil in the Christian view are sin and death, sin in the first place. He comes to free us therefore from sin and death. And he conquers sin by his obedience unto death and he overcomes death by his resurrection. That's it. Christ comes to free us not only from definitive evil and suffering, but also, at least indirectly, from evil and suffering in their temporal and historical dimension. Evil and suffering are linked to sin, not... Now, this uh, sounds as though he's going back on what he said earlier, but not in a superficial or kind of statistical way, but in a complex way. Because suffering, as we experience, can't be divorced, I think Simon mentioned this, from the sin of the beginnings, what St. John calls the sin of the world, the sinful background of the personal actions and social processes in human history. Um, yeah, so that, that, that there is always some connection, not a direct personal connection, there is, in general, a connection between sin and 
suffering. And Christ, by taking up sin, picking up sin by the roots, is therefore indirectly freeing us, preparing the way to free us from all suffering. Um, death, the dissolution of the entire psychophysical personality of man. Death at one level puts an end to suffering, but at another it's the definitive evil that we experience. Christ rescues us from sin, he rescues us from death. He blots out the dominion of sin from human history and gives us the possibility of living in sanctifying grace in a relationship as children of the Father. He takes away the dominion of death by beginning with his resurrection, the process of our future resurrection. He thus opens up the possibility of a definitive happiness in union with God for all those who are saved with suffering totally blotted out. There will be no more weeping, as the Apocalypse said. And though Christ's victory over sin and death does not abolish suffering in the here and now, we're still going, we're going to fall ill and we're still going to do wrong things sometimes and have the consequences of that. We're going to suffer the hands of other people and we're going to die. Uh, nonetheless, Christ throws a new light on suffering and he offers us hope and presents a picture of a love. He shows us a love which is greater than evil. Now then he goes into the actual suffering of Christ himself. And Christ drew, once he especially, well, tomorrow we're keeping, tonight already we're keeping the feast of the baptism of the Lord, the beginning of his public mission. And during that mission, Christ draws close to suffering people all the time. He heals them, he consoles them, he frees them from the from possession. He even raises the dead. He was sensitive to every human suffering, whether of the body or of the soul, Christ. And he addressed his beatitudes to those who suffer. He took suffering on himself. It wasn't that he, he remained immune somehow and just went round getting rid of it for other people, like a doctor who doesn't sort of catch any disease. He experienced tiredness, homelessness, misunderstanding on the part of his friends, and more still. He became progressively isolated and encircled by hostility and the preparations for putting him to death. He foresaw what was awaiting him. We know that from the Gospels three times. He says what's going to happen to him in Jerusalem. He goes to his passion fully aware that this is the way he will strike evil at the roots and accomplish the work of salvation. He rebukes Peter for trying to dissuade him and he, he doesn't take the way of violence, put your sword away. He goes forward, united by love to the Father, uh, to give his life for our salvation. Now here the Pope turns to this, the fourth uh, song of the suffering servant, or fourth of the servant songs in the book of Isaiah, which is an, an extraordinarily prophetic text describing the suffering of Christ. And it, it shows the depth of Christ's sacrifice. Christ takes on the suffering and sin of all of us. Um, he can do this because he's the only begotten son of God who loves his father and by that love overcomes the evil of every sin. So he, here he uses what, another of his images. He annihilates this evil in the spiritual space of the relationship between God and humanity and fills this space with good. Christ does this as the eternal son of God made man. He suffers as a man in his human nature, humanly, but the one who suffers is the son of God. So it is a divine um, suffering in that sense, in the, in the human form. We call Mary, you see, the mother of God, meaning the mother of God made man. And also, uh, you can say that God was crucified for us. God was crucified for us. Not in his divine nature. You can't crucify the divine nature of God. 
but in his human nature. But the person who died, suffered on the cross, was the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. And so Christ's uh, experience of evil uh, was far, well, has a depth to it which we cannot really possibly understand. That the suffering that Christ endured, you might think, well, he was only on the cross for three hours, what about people who are paralyzed all their life or something like that? But these things aren't measured quantitatively, they're measured qualitatively. And what Christ endured in, in his passion had a depth and intensity which was quite unique. Now, Gethsemane, the Pope mentions Gethsemane, that's those two texts there, Matthew 26. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Here, on the one hand, you see that Christ loves his father and wants to obey him and therefore takes on the suffering and on the other the reality of that suffering he, he shudders it's it, extra, I always think this extraordinary if you read the gospels Christ is always sort of in charge in a way uh, he, he's always serene he's, he's well he's not always serene I mean he does get angry and that kind of thing and feels emotions but um, nobody can defeat him in argument nobody can get you know get the better of him and so on and he heals the d diseases and so on and then you get the the garden of gethsemane and it, it's quite different that that he's he's just overwhelmed by the thought of what is coming to him and uh, the, the the gospels use very strong words for what the agony, we talk about the agony, which means struggle, actually, but the struggle Christ went through and his sensitivity, precisely because he was a holy person, he was without sin, the less sin you have, the more sensitive you are to suffering. Sin makes us insensitive to suffering, actually. Um, but the less, and, and Christ's holiness exposed him to suffering. I mean, just to be able to see into human hearts, as he did, that can't be an entirely pleasant experience, um, really. It's, it's, uh, you, I, quite like the, I would quite like to think of it as the, the imagery of the Garden of Gethsemane and the imagery of the, the Garden of Eden. Yeah, yes, that's right. It's, yeah, that's right. It is reversing. It's the act of obedience that reverses the disobedience. of Christ, even all the horrors, the sort of 20th century horrors and camps and gulags and all of those things, in fact are not as evil as what happened on Calvary. And yet out of that supreme evil has come the supreme good of the world's redemption. From the cross flow the rivers of living water. So it is in the cross that we can read the answer to the question of the meaning of suffering. So then he goes um, to the, uh, the, the whole thing of our sharing. He's getting closer to where he wants to get to. He's always, he's always wanting to get back 
to this text that we complete in our flesh the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. He wants to get that. So he comes to our share of suffering and he focuses a lot on the person of Paul and the quotations from St. Paul because St. Paul was the man who um, wrote about this, experienced it very much and wrote about it very eloquently. Um, I mean, there are texts and texts, but there's one here, how he entered um, Paul's experience of suffering as an apostle. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 to 11. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So we are drawn into the experience of Christ. I think it's true to say that uh, Catholicism is particularly sensitive to this. It, it's uh, not something that Protestant theology uh, accepts. Protestant theology has got such an emphasis on Christ did it once for all, which is true, um, and therefore in a way there's nothing left for us to do. We just sit back and Christ hands, hands us redemption, as it were, salvation all wrapped up in a packet and that's it. I mean that's a caricature of, of the position, but in, in uh, flowing from St. Paul, perhaps, and the history of the church, many saints, there is this sense that we are invited to share the sufferings of Christ. The work of redemption was completed by Christ, but not closed by Christ. He invites us to work with him, to take our share in his work of redemption. Uh, he says this, um, the Pope, with the passion of Christ, all human suffering has found itself in a new situation. Human suffering itself has been redeemed. Christ has raised human suffering to the level of the redemption. Thus, each man in his suffering can also become a sharer in the redemptive suffering of Christ. So this really gives a meaning to our suffering. It's not just an accident, some unfortunate, terrible thing. It is an opportunity to share in the redemptive suffering of Christ himself. And uh, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul, and this goes for each of us, uh, it, it, you know, at, at our lesser level, but Paul is drawn into the death and resurrection of Christ. And so we experience both those. When we are baptized, we go down into the water, we share Christ's death, and we rise as children of God. And that pattern stamps our whole Christian life. And it's, we find it again <coughs> in the Eucharist where Christ's death and resurrection is sacramentally present. It is through suffering that we become worthy to enter the kingdom of God, says Paul. Those who share Christ's sufferings are called to sharing glory. Suffering, again this is the Pope, is an invitation to manifest the moral greatness of man, his spiritual maturity. Christ, by allowing us to share his suffering, reveals depths in ourselves that we didn't think were there before. That's very true. Suffering is a trial. It is an experience of weakness that opens us to the working of God's power. My power is made perfect in weakness. Suffering is something Paul rejoices in because it produces endurance, and character and a hope which cannot be disappointed. So in Colossians 1.24, says the Pope, again he goes back to this, we reach the final stage of the spiritual journey 
in relation to suffering. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. This is Paul, and in my flesh I complete what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. That's a text that has put the theologians in a twist big time because it sounds as though we're saying that there's something incomplete about Christ's sufferings, which we cannot say. But it's rather that we are invited to share in them and extend them through time. Christ makes us members of his body. In this body, Christ wishes to be united with every individual, and in a special way, he is united to those who suffer. suffer. Christ's own suffering created the good of the world's redemption. No one can add to Christ's work, but we can share in it. Our suffering, too, can be creative. Christ's suffering created the redemption. Insofar as man becomes a sharer in Christ's suffering in any part of the world and at any time in history, to that extent, he, is in his own, he in his own way completes the suffering through which Christ accomplished the redemption of the world. Christ's suffering lives on. It lives on in his body, the church. By means of it, the church completes the redemptive work of Christ. The church is the space, the context, the dimension in which human suffering can be taken up into the suffering of Christ and complete it. That is share in its creative character. So that's that section. This, this, I think the Pope is really wanting to open our eyes and our hearts to this sense that we, we are, as Christians, uh, simply invited to unite our sufferings with those of Christ and therefore complete his work of redemption, just as we do it by other ways as well, by when we you know, when we try to live a good life, when we try to speak the truth or speak about Christ and so on, these are all ways of perpetuating the presence of Christ in the world. But so can be our suffering. Our suffering isn't left outside that. Everything. Christ has come to redeem the whole of us. So, we come now to sort of really the end, in a way, what he calls the gospel of suffering. You remember he, he wrote... Um, a great encyclical about, called uh, Evangelium Vitae, the gospel of life, the gospel of life. So this is the gospel of suffering. What does the church have to say? What, does, what is the good news about suffering? That's a paradox, because suffering is bad news, I mean, by definition. And suffering in itself, one must never remember, is, is not a good thing. It's not that there's any value in suffering in itself. It's, it's because of its connection to love that it can be a good thing. Uh, the church has received from the first Christians a specific gospel of suffering. Now Mary is someone who exemplifies this gospel particularly, the Pope said. She shared in her son's mission completely, even to Calvary, where her suffering reached an intensity which can be hardly imagined from a human point of view, but which was mysteriously and supernaturally fruitful for the redemption of the world. Mother, behold your son. She became, through, through what she went through at Calvary, Mary became a mother in a new sense, an even wider sense than she was already. She became the mother of the body of Christ, as she had already been the mother of, as it were, the actual Christ. Um, what the Gospel affirms and again, sorry to bang on, but we've got to get the point. No point coming here this evening, we don't get the point. Or John Paul II's point, I mean. Uh, is the salvific power and the salvific significance of, Christ, of suffering in Christ's messianic mission and subsequently in the mission and vocation of the church. Christ did not conceal from his followers the need for suffering, for taking up the cross after him daily, for denying ourselves, embracing ourselves for persecution. And he then mentions really, uh, this is just playing with him a tiny bit, kind of three chapters to this gospel. How, how do we actually share in the suffering of Christ? Well, first of all, and this is a very strong thing in the gospels and in the letters of Paul and in the whole history of the church, suffering for Christ. Christ. 
for the sake of Christ, for the name of Christ. In other words, undergoing hatred and persecution. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, 2 Timothy 3.12. This is something that's happened. I mean, it, you know, we all experience it to some extent, and we may, you know, the way our world is going, we may experience it more in time to come. But uh, the following of, of Christ has entailed persecution, or suffering, or opposition, and sometimes of an extreme and violent kind. And again, he doesn't say it here, but the Pope said it enough on other occasions, that it was the, the, the biggest number of martyrs is from the 20th century. Um, and uh, not just the, big, the biggest number, but just the greatest extent, the greatest depth of suffering. And some of the stories are terrible. And some of the stories we don't know yet, like what, what has happened and is happening in China, for example. Uh, that's, that's sort of hidden. But the persecution of Christians in China has been something terrible. I remember an archbishop once in Rome saying, when, when all this is publicly known, what's happened, people will be amazed at the, uh, what the Chinese Christians have endured for their loyalty to Christ. You know, just something to bear in mind, and it's kind of going on now as well. This, um, so that's the first chapter, really, is this suffering for Christ. But then there is suffering with Christ. In other words, we all, just going through life, we suffer, one thing and another, and yet we can unite our human sufferings to his salvific suffering. There is a particular, some of you have mentioned this already, there's a particular power and grace hidden in suffering which draws us close to Christ and converts and changes, deepens, widens, opens, transforms us. We can discover a whole new dimension to our life through suffering. Suffering is in itself is an experience of evil, but Christ has made suffering the firmest basis of the definitive good, namely the good of eternal salvation. Christ is present in every human suffering, transforming it from within, opening new horizons, those of the kingdom of God, to those who suffer. This is a work of the spirit and a work of the spiritual motherhood of Mary. It, it's, uh, he just slips that in there, that... that Mary's motherhood draws us into this mystery. So this process, he said, the journey of discovery of the salvific meaning of suffering can be long and difficult. It almost always begins with a protest. Why? Christ answers from the cross, but not directly and not in the abstract. This, this is a very strong point. Christ, if you were, this is really good. Remember this. Christ does not explain in the abstract the reasons for suffering. But before all else, he says, follow me. Come, take part through your suffering in this work of saving the world. A salvation achieved through my suffering, through my cross. So it's not. Christ isn't a philosopher. He, he, he hasn't, in that sense, solved the problem. He invites us into the mystery of his own suffering. And gradually, as we take up our cross, the salvific meaning of suffering is revealed to us. And then out of that comes peace and even joy. And <coughs> the Pope says this, it is suffering more than anything else which clears the way for the grace which transforms human souls. Suffering, more than anything else, makes present in the history of humanity the powers of the redemption. That's quite an extraordinary, well, strong statement. Hard one to accept. The weakness of suffering is the most powerful weapon in the struggle against evil. And in her own battles, the church looks to those who suffer for the world's salvation. I think that was some, really, I think it was probably Jean Vanier, maybe, who drew the Pope's attention to that at Lourdes. Yeah, there, as I mentioned at the beginning. And then the, he comes finally to the Good Samaritan. And this is it, if you like the, the third chapter. 
which is compassion. Compassion means suffering with. And this is, in, in a way, just as this Colossians 1.24 is where he's getting to the whole time. In another way, it, the Good Samaritan is what he's getting to at the end. The Good Samaritan, in a way, sums up our, our, the Christian response to suffering. Anyone who stops beside his suffering neighbour is a Good Samaritan. Stops not out of curiosity, but with inner availability, with compassion. So the passion of Christ is completed by our compassion. But this compassion is active. Everyone who helps his suffering neighbour is a good Samaritan. He, he puts his whole heart into it, nor does he spare material means. He makes a, a gift of himself. So here we have yet another dimension of suffering. It is present to unleash love in the human person. It's true in many ways, nothing draws us towards another person so much as their suffering in many ways. It, it can open love in a big way. And so he says, the world of human suffering unceasingly calls for another world, the world of human love. So if you go to Lourdes and these places, you see that. You really see human suffering. You see people in, in the most terrible states, and yet you see the love and the care with which they are being cared for. You see that these two come together. It's a wonderful thing. This love, this activity, finds expression in certain professions, especially like doctor, that of doctor or nurse and others, and in institutions. This parable has become part of the patrimony of humanity. I remember once um, we, had, we were reading in the refectory in the monastery a book about Afghanistan, and it was, a, uh, it was about a Scottish missionary who went there, and she read the story of the Good Samaritan out to these Afghani women who weren't Christians. And uh, she was utterly taken aback by their reaction. Their reaction was, what a silly idiot uh, the chap was to get beaten up. And, and it, you know, they just laughed, you know, they just sort of deserved him right to get beaten up, walking along that road uh, where you knew there were bandits. And she was utterly horrified by that. That's where Christianity wasn't there. Uh, and, and the story was just, yeah, well, like, he deserved all he got. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, but we all say that sometimes towards some people. Well, they can stew in their own juice, you know. Uh, but there are also those who do voluntary work outside their professional life. Some people have professional jobs, but do voluntary work for others. And when this is done for gospel reasons, it is an apostolate. Children and young people must be educated into the sensitivity of the Good Samaritan. And each person, each of us, needs to feel personally called to show love to, the, to, suffer, to those who suffer. The parable shows that the true, true Christian attitude is not one of passivity, but of the active doing of good after the pattern of Christ. Suffering is present in the world in order to release love, in order to give birth to works of love towards our neighbour, in order to transform the whole of human civilization into a civilization of love. In this love, the love of the Good Samaritan, or the love of compassion, the salvific meaning of suffering is completely accomplished and reaches its definitive dimension. You see, boing, he's, he's thrown, his, he's got his treble 20. Uh, we're playing darts, you know. He's hit the, he's hit the bullseye uh, again. He's got to the point that, that in the love that goes out to meet human suffering, that's what it's all about. Why does God allow suffering? Because out of it comes this love. Because Christ, we, we have only known the love of God to the extent that we have because of the evil that has afflicted us and because of the incarnation and God coming into the world to show this love that took evil upon itself for us to give us back the good.
So at one and the same time, he says, Christ has taught man to do good by his suffering and to do good to those who suffer. That's the double thing. In this double aspect, he has completely revealed the meaning of suffering. Even though it will still disconcert and bewilder us. Taught man to do good by his suffering. We can do good by suffering. Because suffering is so often an experience of uselessness. That suffering makes you useless. So maybe that's what the Pope felt after he'd been shot. What am I, you know, I'm lying in bed being useless. And then it dawned on him that it was something deeper. So there it is. Um, Christ, it's Christ who fully reveals man to himself. That's from Vatican II, one of the Pope's favorite, John Paul II's favorite quotations. And this is very true as regards suffering. Um, Christ reveals to us what it means to suffer. And so he appeals, this is speaking as the Pope, for the help of those who are suffering in the terrible battle between the forces of good and evil revealed to our eyes by our modern world, may your suffering in union with Christ be victorious. There we are. That's it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I hope that, thank you.